started. Um, so today we have, uh, again, Andy Lewis Pye, one of our faculty fellows, uh, to be giving the second part of his two-part introduction to consensus. So, Andy. Thanks, Tim. Right, yeah, so uh, let's start by just quickly just recapping like, where we are, what we talked about last time. Uh, so we, we had this, uh, we set up a, f a formal framework, right? And so let's just remind ourselves how that worked. Let's, Joe's just coming in. Okay, so we've got a set of n processors. We're calling them from, uh, giving them names from zero up to n minus one. Up to f of those may be faulty, but we don't know which. Okay, every processor knows n and they know f. Okay, so they know the number of processes involved. Uh, they know some upper bound on the number of faulty processes. Uh, and they also know their own name, right? <coughs> Okay, that's given to them as part of their input. Uh, we're considering an execution which is divided up into discrete time slots. You've got time slot zero, then time slot one, time slot two, and so on. At each time slot, each processor receives a set of messages. They carry out some finite set of instructions, and that, that allows them to decide what messages they're going to send at that time slot. Okay, and then you move on to the next time slot. Okay. Between each pair of processors, there's some authenticated channel. Okay, so for each pair, like I and J, there's some channel just between those two. Only those two, those two uh, processors, only those two guys can send messages on that channel. And each processor knows exactly who's at the end of their channel, each of, the, each of their channels, right? So if I'm, if I'm I and there's J over there, and then I've got a channel to J, I know J's at the end of that channel. Yep. Okay, then we had to decide uh, how reliable do we want uh, to think of message delivery is being. Uh, so last time we were focusing the entire time on the synchronous setting. Okay, so the, the simplest version of that is just that when I, if I send a message at time t, it arrives at time t plus one. Slight variant would be that you have some, some bound delta. If I sign it, send, send a message at time t, it, it arrives at least by time t plus delta. Okay, but for our purposes here, we don't have to really worry about the difference between these two because every single theorem we're going to talk about holds for one, and if and only if it holds for the other, with like a very slightly modified proof. Okay, so we're, we get some focused on the, the, the simple one. We send a message at time t, it arrives at t, time t plus one. Uh, yeah, so obviously that, that's a, like a strong assumption. So later on today, we're gonna uh, consider the, the partially synchronous setting where message delivery might sometimes be less reliable. Okay, but for now, at the beginning, we're gonna stay on the synchronous setting for a bit. Okay, then we also have to decide how our faulty processors can behave. Uh, so basically, we're, fo we're focusing on uh, Byzantine failures. Okay, so they can, they can just behave arbitrarily and think of them as being nasty. And then, so what's the, the overall sort of research program we're, we're going through? Okay, so what we're interested in is okay, so for which N and F, remember F is the number of faulty processors, for which N and F do there exist protocols to solve, to solve Byzantine agreement, another variant of the problem? How does that depend on our assumptions regarding uh, the reliability of, of message delivery, right? whether we're in the synchronous setting or partially synchronous setting, which I'll introduce in a bit? Uh, well, how does it depend on the form of faulty behavior? In fact, we're just we're focusing on Byzantine faults. And then how does the, the answer depend on whether we're given a public key infrastructure? OK, so those are the basic questions we're, we're interested in. Uh, and then last time, so what did we do? So, we introduce Byzantine agreement and Byzantine broadcasts. If you remember what they are, so for Byzantine agreement, every processor has got an input. Okay, all the honest processors have to give an output, the same output as each other. And if they're all given the same input, they all have to give that common input as their output. And okay, that's Byzantine agreement. For Byzantine broadcast, you've got a single, like a, one, one of the processors, processors is like a designated broadcaster. Everybody knows who that, that guy is. Only the broadcast has an input. Okay, now it's got a fairly similar. All the honest processors have to terminate and give an output, and they're the same output as each other. And if the broadcaster is, is, is honest, then the, the common output has to be that guy's input. Okay, so he has to successfully tell everybody about his, his, his value. Okay. okay, so that was Byzantine agreement, Byzantine broadcast. Uh, and so what we saw is that they're not the same problem. Right? There are some contexts in which you can solve one and not the other. But if you're considering the synchronous setting, and if f is less than n over 2, if you've got an honest majority, then they kind of they easily reduce to each other. OK, so some of the time, we can sort of think of them as being uh, the same problem. OK, okay uh, and then we had these sort of two main theorems. So um, yeah, all the time working in the synchronous setting. So first of all, the sort of easiest case is you have a, a PKI, public infrastructure. 
So in the single data setting with the public infrastructure, then you can solve Byzantine broadcast for any number of faulty processes. Okay, that's just the Dolev Strong protocol we went through. And note that that tells you everything you need to know about Byzantine agreement as well. Okay, because we saw Byzantine agreement can't be solved if f is greater than n over 2. But if f is less than n over 2, then you, know, you, can, you, you, solve, you can solve Byzantine broadcast. Okay, so this tells you you can solve Byzantine broadcast. And therefore, you can solve Byzantine agreement if f is less than n over 2. And if f is greater than n over 2, right, you know you can't. Yep. Copy that. Okay, so that's the first one. And then this one we, we also saw, but it was broken down into two parts, right? So we had the impossibility result, and then we had the, the possibility result. So, okay, now we're still in the secret setting, but now we don't have a public, public infrastructure. Uh, so first of all, so, okay, you, you can't solve it if uh, f is greater than n over 3. Now, either of the problems, if f is greater than n over 3. But you can if f is less than n over 3. Yep. Okay. Okay, so we're going to do this time then. So we're going to move, first of all, so we're going to stay in the synchronous setting for a bit. And we're going to set a state machine replication, which is basically what like, uh, blockchain protocols do. Okay, and then we'll do, then we'll introduce the partially synchronous setting and we'll basically do this whole, whole thing again. But I'll sort of cut it a bit shorter this time because basically what I'll do is I'll just I'll show you Tendermint and that will sort of do most things for us. Okay. And then, okay, so so far we've just been talking about permission protocols the whole time. Uh, right at the end, uh, we'll talk a little bit about how this stuff compares with uh, permissionless, the permissionless setting, okay? like Bitcoin in particular. Okay, so state machine replication. So as I said, roughly, so state machine replication is just what blockchain protocols are supposed to do. Okay, so you've got a bunch of clients. They're sending in uh, a sequence of transactions. Right? They're choosing what trans transactions they want to send in. Uh, and then the, the process is implementing the SMR protocol, the state machine replication protocol. They just have to agree on an order in which to implement those, those transactions. Okay, I guess everyone's familiar with that. Uh, just like a word of warning. So often, like, as opposed to Byzantine agreement, uh, and Byzantine broadcast. So SMR is often treated like somewhat informally in the literature, so you're not quite sure exactly what formalization you're using. Okay, so sometimes I think that leads to things being a bit confusing. Okay, so I was going to write down a sort of particular formalization here, but there are other approaches you, you could take. Okay, and sometimes things will be sensitive to exactly how you set things up. Okay, so later on we'll talk about like does, does Bitcoin satisfy SMR, and you'll see it's a bit sensitive to exactly what you mean by SMR. Right? Okay, uh, and so previously, okay, we were interested in is there a PKI, is, uh, is there not a PKI? Here, I'm just going to focus on the, the, the uh, setting where we have a public key infrastructure, okay, because generally, I think people normally consider SMR protocols in the context of a, of a PKI, okay. Okay, so, uh, right, so I'm going to write down a sort of a formalized, a formal version a little bit, but first of all, just at a sort of high level. So two basic differences between SMR on the one hand and BA and BB, Byzantine Agreement and Byzantine Broadcast on the other hand, are uh, as follows. So first of all, SMR protocols involve uh, like a second type of protocol participant, okay? So we're calling them clients. So roughly the idea is the clients don't actively participate right, in the process of reaching consensus. All they're basically doing is they're sending in these transactions. Sometimes they're also called requests when they have other names. They send in these transactions that the process is actually carrying out the consensus protocol. Okay, and the clients have to be reliably informed by those processes when transactions have been impl implemented. Okay, so they should be playing a sort of passive role here. Yep. One basic difference, second biggest difference, so SMR, uh, unlike BA and BB, doesn't require processes to give a single output, right, but rather to, have, now they have to produce like a, a continually growing output sequence, okay, that grows in length as, as the clients submit more transactions. We have to gradually confirm more and more transactions. Okay, so yeah, so now I'm going to sort of write down one possible sort of way of, uh, one possible formal setup. I guess some of this is going to be like a little bit arbitrary, but I just want to write some sort of down something concrete so we have a, a particular detail, a, a particular version to talk about. Okay. Okay. So we've got a set of n processes. Again, we're, talk, we're calling them zero up to n minus one, uh, so we can talk about things mod m, and we've got a set of m clients. Okay. Zero up to n minus one. Uh, I'm going to assume, given a PKI for the set of all clients and processes, okay, maybe that's not entirely necessary, but again, just to make things simple. I'm going to start off that way. Okay. And again, we're going to have authenticated channels. They work the same as before. Again, all the processes have, each pair of processes has an authenticated channel between them. 
Okay, so it's basically the same time as before. But okay, I'm going to assume for each client, it just ha there's at least one non-faulty processor that it has uh, a channel to. Okay, and again, you could maybe set these up slightly differently, but okay, that seems like a sort of minimal requirement. Okay. Okay, so that's all clear. Uh, and then, okay, so we, we want to sort of somehow formalize the idea that the, the clients shouldn't, they should only be able to play like a passive role. We don't want them to be able to sort of participate in the process of, con of reaching consensus in a sort of sneaky way. Basically, because we want to answer like for what NNF is consensus po possible. And if the clients can sort of get involved in some way, that might sort of screw up that analysis somewhat, right? Okay, so we want to formalize the idea that they really are passive here. Yeah, maybe they can sort of like, you know, change the number of processes involved by, you know, and are, are they honest, are they not honest, and so on, right? So, you have to, yeah. Is this assumption realistic, though? Because, like, in a real deployment, those surely can be clients too, right? Like, how oh, no, I, I I'm not, I'm not worried about whether the, the note, well, I mean, okay. I think you can sort of separate their, their roles here, okay? So, okay, in their role as clients, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and we've got to imagine that they can, they can send arbitrary transactions and the, the, the protocol has to be able to deal with that, right? And then I guess I'm sort of thinking of their role as processor as being like a separate role, okay? Yeah, I have the same question. Why do you need this uh, exemption there? Uh, well, again, if, uh, for, for that reason, right? So if I want to sort of separate out the fact that the, the, the clients are sort of passive, right? So if the clients can send any, any message they like, they can just participate in the, in the consensus protocol. I want to know for what NNF, you know, can we, can we solve certain problems? And then we, if, if the clients can really like start joining in, then I have to start answering questions like, are the clients honest, are they dishonest, like, and so on, right? It's going to confuse things, okay? Okay, so I'm going to say, I'm going to say they can only send transactions. Uh, yeah, for now, I'm going to assume they're all signed. Every, every, every time you send a, a transaction, it's signed. Okay, and I'm going to suppose clients can send arbitrary signed transactions on their channels, okay? And the idea is that you know, the protocol isn't able to tell the clients what, what transactions they can send. If they can send arbitrary transactions, you can, you can think of that as being controlled by the adversary, right? Okay, the protocol has to be able to deal with arbitrary sets of transactions sent by the clients. Okay. okay, and then, uh, okay, so a confirmation for a particular transaction, TX says, just, it's just a transaction signed by one of the processes, okay? So we're going to think of that as being a... This is one way of formalization and formalizing the notion of a, a message from a processor that says this is confirmed. Okay. Happy so far? Okay, so what are the requirements then? Yeah. Question. So the confirmation mm. is a signature by only one processor. Yeah, okay, but we would require more than one confirmation to be happy it's been confirmed. Yeah. I think it kind of has we kind of have to, right? Otherwise, uh, uh, yeah. Is going to mislead, uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. So you're, you're going to require F plus one confirmation. Right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So uh, what are the requirements? So basically, the requirements are that so the the processors have to keep a a, like a log of transactions, right? Uh, and so we have two requirements: the consistency and liveness. I think everybody will, everybody's sort of familiar with these ideas. So basically, consistency says that the logs don't disagree with each other, right? And liveness says that, so if a non-faulty uh, processor receives a transaction, then eventually that's included in the, in the blockchain. Yeah. Everybody happy with that? I'm like, we can sit, sit on it, but I think everyone's familiar with, with blockchain protocols, do you basically, yeah? Okay. Okay, so summing up. Uh, so processor I regards a trans transaction as confirmed once a transaction enters its log. Okay, so roughly the, the consistency and liveness conditions say so that all non-faulty processes must agree on the set of confirmed transactions, although maybe not exactly the time, same time, one could be slower than the other. Uh, and any transactions received by a non-faulty processor must be eventually confirmed. Okay, so again, I think everyone's happy with that basic idea. Yeah. Is it worth distinguishing between a transaction known to some non-faulty processor versus known to all non-faulty processors? Well, I mean, not really, because here I'm, I'm requiring that I mean, you can just propagate them because they're, they're signed by these guys over here. So you can't be making up the transactions, so you can just, just propagate them, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and then a last condition, which you can sort of like uh, be interesting later on, maybe when we think about uh, Bitcoin and other stuff. So there's, a, a sort of, there's an idea that these clients should be uh, lazy in some way, right? So the final condition is. Um, <clears throat> So we require that clients should receive F plus one confirmations 
for a given transaction, right, signed by distinct processors, even only if the transaction is confirmed by a non faulty processor. Okay. Obviously, we need f plus one because otherwise the the the, the dishonest guys could be misleading. Okay. So what we're trying to capture here is just the idea that uh, okay, so. Not only are the, are the clients not very passive, they're, they're not participating, they should be able to, they don't even really have to listen to what's going on. So they, they should be able to go away, come back later on, they don't even have to like, really pay very much attention at all. Okay, if I've got F plus one confirmations, great, then I, I know my, my transaction's been confirmed. Okay? So here, we're trying to formalize the idea of a really, like, a, a, a passive and lazy client. Okay? So, so the nodes are actually speaking back to the client. Yeah, yeah. So, well, they, they send confirmations messages back to the clients. And obviously, so I need F plus one because the, the dishonest guys could lie about when things are confirmed. But if I get F plus one, then I know it's been confirmed. I don't really have to pay any, any role in the process of that. Okay. okay, so we set things up that way. And obviously, there are certain aspects of that we can, we can play with, right? Then, uh, so an immediate consequence of that is the, the lazy client condition is, so SMR can't be solved then when F is greater than N over two. Because I need F plus one confirmation, so the, these, these honest guys could just sit there and never send confirmations and never get anywhere. Okay. Okay. Again, though, so it matters exactly how you set up SMR because that doesn't need to be true if we set things up a slightly different way, right? Okay. 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 Uh, so for which N and F is it possible then? So well, so first of all, okay, I'm just gonna. We'll see like a slicker, slicker uh, protocols later on. But first of all, let's just see if we can sort of do it quite easily using Dolev Strong. Okay, so if f is less than n over two, it's easy to modify the Dolev Strong protocol to give a protocol for SMR. Okay, so basically it's going to run repeated instances of, of Dolev Strong. Okay, uh, so we have processor i mod n acting as broadcaster in the ith instance, right? The i ith sort of version of Dolev Strong. Remember, Dolo Strong has this nice property that has like a fixed number of rounds, right? So you can just replace one instance after another one in quite a sort of simple way. Okay. okay, when process I is leader, okay, basically they form like a you know, block of new transactions I think should be uh, confirmed, right? They broadcast that sequence of transactions as their value for agreement, okay? All right, so they're acting as leader, they suggest a new set of stuff to, to be confirmed. When I say broadcast, I've just been sending that to all processes, right? Okay. Okay, and obviously, okay, so it's all minutia. So processes ignore suggested values for agreement that uh, you know, look like they're obviously wrong, okay? If they're not in the right form, or if they involve you know, transactions that they've already been allowed to log and so on, okay? Okay, and then if the Dolev Strong protocol decides uh, false or bottom, or whatever you want to call that symbol, right? Which is one of the, the possibilities if the, if the leader's dishonest. Then the non faulty processes don't extend their log. If it agrees on a particular value t, that set of transactions, then they, then they append it to their log. Okay, so there's nothing complicated so far. Just to sort of wrap it up, though, we have to worry about the, the clients getting their confirmations, right? And each client's only got a channel, maybe to let, you know, uh, one honest uh, processor, or maybe more, but no, no, at least one. So just a fairly of, on, of obvious little thing, we're just going to sort of gossip uh, confirmations, okay? So when a non faulty processor adds any transaction to its log, it produces confirmation for that transaction and sends that to all processors and all clients. But then that might not be enough because they, they, I might not have a channel directly to a specific client. So they also resend all transactions and confirmations received. So when, when I first use a confirmation for a particular transaction produced by some other processor J, okay, it sends that confirmation to all processors and all clients, which has a communication channel as well. Okay, that, that just nothing complicated or clever happening there. It's just make sure that the clients are getting enough confirmations. Okay. Okay. So. Now we know SMR can be solved quite easily using uh, Dolev Strong. Obviously, that's not a particularly sort of slick way of doing it. Maybe, maybe we're going to have a nicer way. So later on, we're going to uh, see Tendermint, which actually operates, that works in the partially synchronous setting, so therefore it works in the synchronous setting, uh, and it's sort of slicker in, in, in various ways. Thank you. Everybody happy so far? That good? Okay. Okay, so there we used uh, Dolo Strong to solve SMR, just to sort of I just want to keep it clear you now what's easily reducible to what. Uh, so let's next see. So a solution to SMR in the synchronous setting can also be used to solve uh, Byzantine broadcast and therefore Byzantine agreement, right? Because we've got all these different forms of the problem. So I, just want to, I think it's useful to keep in mind what's easily reducible to what, right? Okay. 
Okay, so if we want to solve uh, Byzantine broadcast, okay, so that, that means you're, you're given some set V, right? And you've got to give an output in V, right? That's what V is here. So we're going to let bottom there uh, denote a default element of V. So what we do, because we're on an instance of SMR in which the number of clients is equal to the number of processors, okay, in which clients have channels to all processors. You just have a nice, simple, complete graph there. Okay, for each I, we have processor I also control client I. Right? It might seem sort of fairly trivial what we're doing here, but no, formally in the SMR protocol, it's the clients who have to send transactions in. So that's why we're setting things up this way. Okay, then in the first time slot, we had the broadcaster. Let's say that's I. He sends a, a single transaction from client I to all the other processors, right? Which is a signed version of his input. Okay, in the second time slot, okay, so, so if, they're, if they're honest, they'll do that. If they're, if they're dis not honest, if they're dishonest, they might not, right? They might not send some message and so on. So in the second time slot, each non faulty J sends a signed, did not receive transaction uh, from the client that they control, they didn't receive a transaction from client I. Okay, and then basically we just run SMR. So we, we wait until the SMR protocol confirms a sign value, well, either confirms a sign value from the broadcaster, in which case everyone agrees on that value. Or else we confirm F plus one that did not receive transactions, right? Signed by different distinct, distinct processes, in which case we all output the, the default value false. You happy with that? Yeah, so if uh, they'll certainly all agree on some value because we've got liveness here in our SML our protocol and we've also got consistency, everyone, so everyone sees the same values, right? Uh, and if the, if, the, if the process, if the broadcaster is honest, then he's going to send out these values and they'll, they'll, they'll agree on his value. So I didn't really see the role of the clients. Well, the, the role of the clients here is just kind of like a sort of fairly silly formal role. It's just if you have an SMR protocol, it's the clients who are supposed to send in transactions, right? So I'm just, I'm just giving them that formal role. I mean, like, there's nothing clever happening there. Okay, right, okay, yeah. Yeah. How would you say that, uh, so to what extent is like in all the settings that we normally talk about, one should review, one should regard all three problems as equivalent? When should we regard all three as equivalent? Like, should we, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, none like, of them. Are there interesting, like, I, I realize there are cases where it, there are these differences, but do we have Well, I mean, okay, like, if F is greater than N over 2, for example, like, then, you know, you can't do Byzantine agreement, right? Yeah, like I said, I know there are cases where you get these distinctions, but so, like, I just, are they ever the scenarios we're actually going about? Well, so in the partially synchronous setting, you can't solve the way I stated it here. Anyway, you can't solve Byzantine broadcast either, because the, the broadcaster might not just might not send anything. Okay, so I think they they are all uh, different to each other, definitely. Yeah. So in the synchronous setting, maybe it's the first order one can think about this. Yeah, basically. in the synchronous setting, if you were basically thinking, you normally think F is less than N over two, fine, then they're all the same, aren't they? I think. I mean, yeah, I know. I think yeah. But I mean, it's still a strong effect like, as the exception that proves the rule. Right. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. it's like, yeah. It's like in mm -hmm. all other cases, we're always thinking about honest majority anyway. Yeah, much. yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 So that's uh, we're done then uh, with the synchronous setting. So now we want to move on to the partially synchronous setting. Right. So the idea is. The synchronous setting is nice and tidy, but maybe it's not that realistic. Sometimes you know you might want to be able to deal. In real life, sometimes the network goes down, you should be able to deal with that, right? Okay, so in the partially synchronous setting, the rough idea is that processes are told a bound delta, which will hold when network conditions are good, okay? Sometimes, though, network, network failure might happen, uh, and messages might be delivered for, uh, delayed for like, arbitrarily long periods. Okay, so now, again, the rough idea, so I'm going to formalize this. So protocols now have to like, survive extended periods of network failure and produce outputs when network conditions are good. Okay, so if you're thinking about an SMR protocol, then you should you know, maintain consistency when there's network failure. Yeah? But then you, can only, you can't be expected to like, confirm new transactions when the messages aren't being delivered because you're not even hearing about them. Right? So you have to maintain consistency while there's network failure, but then the liveness, the confirmation of new transactions could happen, should happen whenever network conditions are good. Okay. So how do we formally define that? So normally, the standard way is to use a little sort of technical trick. Okay, uh, so we formalize this by positing the existence of some unknown global, stabi stabi global stabilization time, okay, GST. 
So it's unknown in the sense that, yeah, so it's not given as an input to the processes. So they don't know what it is, but it exists. Okay, and we specify that, okay, so that the bound delta holds after GST, but, you know, who knows what happens before GST. Okay, so any message now, if it's sent at time t, it's received by time uh, at least, like right, at maximum, t of GST and delta, right, by that time, could be before, yeah? Right, so in other words, if you send before the global stabilization time, it could be delayed right until the global stabilization time has, has happened. But if you send after that, then the, then the bound delta holds. Yeah. Okay, so that might initially be a bit confusing because we wanted to formalize a situation where you know, sometimes network conditions were good, then network conditions were bad, then they were good again, then they're bad again, and sort of you know, continue your fashion like that, right? So why should it be the case? There's, there's some point after which networks conditions are always good. Is that really formalizing what we want? Okay, well, uh, you can kind of see in some like, uh, intuitive rough argument that, that this does uh, suffice to capture the more general notion. Okay, so we can give uh, an approximate sort of argument, right? Because, okay, here we have a formal definition. I guess the, the more general version I didn't formally define, so I can't give you like a formal proof. But, uh, okay, so here's a, uh, an intuitive uh, idea, these two ideas. Uh, this does sort of capture the more general notion too, right? So any protocol which functions under the apparently easier GST model right, right, will also function under the, the more general conditions when we may be sort of just continually oscillating between good and bad network conditions. Um, <clears throat> Right, to see that, let's make it concrete. Let's consider a protocol for Byzantine agreement. Okay, well, if the protocol ever violated agreement or validity under the, the more general model, okay, then it would also do, do so under GST. Right? We just have to choose GST to be sufficiently late. Okay, so that way is round is fine. On the other hand, if the protocol satisfies termination under the GST model, okay, then for any choice of n, any choice of inputs, any choice of behavior for the faulty processes, and any choice of G GST, there exists some t such that all non-faulty processes terminate within that time, GST plus t. Okay? So the protocol also terminates under the more general model so long as network conditions are good for sufficiently long. Right? Wherever you are, basically, if you then make network conditions good for sufficiently long, you have to eventually get some, uh, everybody has to terminate. Yeah? Okay, so this is just, uh, I guess, it makes it a, a nice sort of uh, easy, well, it's a nice little trick in terms of giving, giving us a simple way of defining the, the partially synchronous setting. Okay, so I guess maybe that's the most standard uh, formalization of the partially synchronous setting. In fact, there, there's another one, which is uh, this one. Okay, so in this one, we suppose that the, the bound delta now always holds, okay, not just after GST, it always holds, but now we don't know what it is. Okay, so the protocol has to, has to function, even though we don't know what the bound delta is. Okay, so I'm calling that the, the unknown delta setting. Okay, so now it might be annoying because you've got these two different definitions. We don't want to have more cases to deal with. Uh, but basically, guys, as long as all we care about is like, you know, when can we make a working protocol, like for which N and F will a protocol work, you can see that these two uh, definitions are equivalent, okay? Okay, so first of all, if the protocol works for the, the unknown delta model, then it works under the, the GST version, right? Because for any execution of the protocol, messages will always be delivered within some, some, some bounds, uh, delta prime, which is just GST plus delta, right? Yeah, so there is some bounds, so the messages will always, always be delivered within that, within that bound, no matter how long we go, we go on for, yeah? Okay, in the other direction, it's also like fairly simple, maybe a little bit more tricky. Okay, and let's suppose we have a, a protocol which functions under the GST model. Now I'm going to turn this into the protocol that functions under the, the unknown delta model. So what do we do? Well, we've got a protocol that functions under the GST model, so we have to give them some value for delta. Okay, that's one of the, the inputs in that model. So let's just give them the, the input delta is one. Okay, then what we do is a, a sort of simple trick. So then we insert increasing intervals between the time slots at which processes execute their instructions. Okay, so, right, so maybe processes might implement their instructions for time t actually at time 2t. So we're actually getting the same instructions because we're sort of spacing them out so there's a bigger and bigger gap between them. Okay, and obviously then at time 2t we're sort of pretending it's time t, right? 
with our, with our, as far as our instructions are concerned. Okay, so we, if we do that, then they, they don't know the actual value delta. Okay, but eventually the time between the, you know, the points at which you actually carry out the, 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 uh, the, the instructions for different time slots would actually eventually be longer than that delta, right? right? So we don't know when that is, but it would eventually be longer than that delta. Yeah. So we'll eventually reach a point where whenever I send a message, it arrives before the next point which I, which I actually execute my next instruction. Right, so we, so we, we achieve a sort of like a version where it's like GST, G, we achieve a sort of GST in effect after some point. Yeah. Isn't there an extra subtlety where a protocol that works with the GST model is allowed to send messages that are not the completely depend on the known delta? You can imagine there are like two different protocols for delta plus one and two, right? And like they don't talk to each other. Uh, well, no, if, if you have to work for any delta, right? So you're, you're given delta. So if I'm, if I'm given a protocol here, I, I can feed it the, the, the input delta is one, and it has to function. Yeah, yeah. 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 you're not allowed to define it. So well. you first, yeah. so you, get, you have to have a protocol that works for all delta. Yes, yeah, yeah, That's yeah. crucial. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Family yeah, of protocols. Yeah, okay, I guess. But generally, it won't really matter. I mean, you just be the same thing, but you space it out. <laughs> right. if, if delta is 5 or delta is 10, normally I can like a... You still have that issue, maybe, though, right? Second? Sorry, uh, if I can give a protocol that looks at delta and specifies after the fact what to do, mm. um, and like, there is no guarantee of consistency. Well, OK, so here we're, we're giving it a particular delta, then, right? So we're, we're giving it the value delta is 1. <laughs> but like, there's no guarantee that protocols for delta equal to 1 and protocols for decibel to two can talk to each other at all. Like, I can okay, give you saying, a GSD right? protocol that... I'm not requiring any, any protocols to talk to each other. I'm, I'm just running a single protocol with, with delta is one, right? And we're, we're spacing out the point at which we execute the instructions. So all that matters is what... what yeah, am I, maybe I'm missing the question. Yeah. Well, I missed this doubling. It's a little unclear to me how exactly the doubling works. So is it just every node independent of what else, like do you just send your first message at time step one, then two, then four, then eight, then 16, or is it? Yeah, like so you, okay, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're sort of, just, you're just waiting longer before you execute exactly the same instructions. So when it gets to that, that point, when it gets to like, uh, no, time slot two, three, you're, you're pretending you're at time slot T, and you're exe executing exactly the same instructions, it's just changing, you're just waiting for longer so, so the messages will actually will, will arrive, right? And are you running the protocol again and again, or repeating every instruction multiple times? No, no, no. We're just, we're just running the protocol once. Running the protocol once. I'm just, okay, imagine I'm running the protocol in a normal way. I'm just like on the side. Imagine I'm actually spacing out the points at which we actually execute the instructions. So let me try to what I was saying before. So suppose I construct a protocol for the GSD model. Uh, what it does is it will XOR every message with the value of delta that is allowed to know, right? Well, so okay, yeah, sorry. It's supporting that delta is known. So, well, so it takes the value of the delta as input, and it, it yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it will XOR every message with delta. Mm. So, like, if two machines are running this for different deltas, like, the messages don't mean anything. Yeah, but here they're not. They're all running it for the same delta, right? <clears throat> they're all just running it for delta as one. Because there's no, so, so like they will proceed in time block or increase. Yeah, yeah, it's the same sort of thing. They're, they're, they're just proceeding through because running exactly the same normal protocol. They've got the, the input delta is one. It's just like unbeknownst to them. Let's imagine I'm, I'm God. I'm controlling them. I'm actually just like squeezing out the time between which they're executing instructions so that things are getting delivered fast enough, right? So as far as they're concerned, they're just like you know, it's just one protocol they're executing with one value of delta. Is there a concern that these nodes make the wrong decision and terminate too soon before hitting GST? Well, no. I mean, we're, okay, okay. We're, we're, they're just running the, the, the standard protocol, right? They're running a normal protocol. We're just, we're just spacing out the time at which it works. So if it, if it works normally, then they have to work here, so long as there is a GST, right? And there, here, there will be a GST. There'll be a GST, there'll be some point after which, whenever I send a message, it is, it's delivered before the next time slot at which we actually execute instructions. Okay. There's an exponential blow up in 
yeah, this, this is a rubbish thing to do. I mean, <laughs> it's just, okay, formally, these two, uh, basically, I want to I wanna work with the GST model, and I want to throw the other one away so we don't have too many things to think about. So these are formally equivalent in some sense, but okay, this is not obviously an efficient thing to do. Right? I mean, you don't, have to, you don't have to double. You could gradually increase it, I guess, but even that's not going to be an efficient thing to do. Okay. Okay, so next observation. Okay, so we want to know, uh, for now, so what can we do in the partial synchronous setting? We're going to sort of concentrate on the GST model. Uh, so Byzantine broadcast, Byzantine agreement, and SMR. So first of all, so Byzantine broadcast isn't possible if the leader might be uh, faulty. Right, this is very easy to see. I mean, simple proof. Okay, so towards the contradiction, I suppose we've got a working protocol. Okay, we've got these two processes. Okay, let's, let's imagine, first of all, if it's non-faulty. Okay, and let's suppose all messages delivered like at the next time slot after after sending. Okay, except that we withhold delivery of messages from the broadcaster. Okay, we're delaying, delaying GST until some other processor terminates. Can we do that? There's got to be a GST in the end. But okay, we can do that as long as some other processor will eventually terminate. Some other honest processor, I should say, non faulty processor terminates. Then, yeah. Okay, well, some processor, well, everybody's, everybody's honest here, so fine. Some processor other than the broadcaster must eventually terminate because this execution is indistinguishable, as far as they're concerned, from one in which GST is zero, but the broadcaster is faulty and doesn't send messages, right? They don't know which one are we in. Is GST passed and he's just faulty or, or not? Okay, and then basically we're, we're, we're done, right? So let T be the first time slot which the processor I and the broadcaster terminates. We define GST equals T plus one. Okay, now basically he's, he's terminated without knowing the broadcaster's input, right? So we, we have to be in trouble at that point. Yeah. So let V be I's output. Now we've got a contradiction because well, he's terminated without knowing the broadcaster's input, so he, you know, he could certainly get output of the wrong thing, right? Violating the validity requirement. Okay, so the execution such as that one in which the broadcaster's input is, isn't V. All right, of course there are, because he hasn't even been able to say what his input is. Yeah. Okay. okay, so Byzantine broadcast uh, isn't possible in the setting. I mean, you, could, you can weaken it so it is, right? So we, we could say instead, okay, rather than requiring everyone to terminate, let's say if one honest guy terminates and if all honest guys terminate, and if the leader's honest, then uh, the honest guys must terminate, and then it becomes possible. Okay, but for now, let's just leave that to one side. So we've, we've got rid of Byzantine broadcast, okay? Um, <clears throat> okay, so now then we're interested in Byzantine agreement and SMR. Okay, so for which N and F can we do that? Uh, and here again, there's a really sort of simple, sort of similar proof. It says you can't do it if f is more than n over 3. OK? Uh, doesn't matter right, when you have a public key infrastructure. OK, so we're going to have a proof for by, by Sanity Agreement. Okay, you can easily modify it for as well. OK, so let's suppose n is 3 and f is 1. Can I get rid of it? Can you see how good? Uh, okay, so n is 3 of f, f is 1. Let's suppose we've got so processors 0 and 1 here. They're, they're honest, they're non faulty, and they've got inputs A and B respectively. Okay, so A and B, they're their inputs, and they're called 0 and 1. And let's suppose processor 2 is faulty 1. Okay, let's suppose any message sent at time t is received at the next time slot. Okay, except we're going to withhold messages between 0 and 1, okay, until after GST. So we're basically not going to allow these two guys to speak to each other. OK. OK, so two is faulty, so what they're going to do. So let's suppose, so in determining the message, it sends to zero. I suppose processor two simulates a non-faulty processor with input A that doesn't receive any messages from one. Yeah. So he's got pretending that he's got input A. He's, he's pretending he hasn't got any messages from one, so he doesn't have to worry about like, you know, forging messages from, him, from, from one or anything like that. OK, and let's suppose in, in determining the message it sends to one, processor two sort of symmetrically simulates a non faulty processor with input B that doesn't receive any messages from zero. OK, well, processor zero has to eventually terminate an output A, right? Because this execution is indistinguishable as far as they're concerned. An execution in which GST is zero, but one is faulty and isn't sending messages. Right? So they ha eventually have to terminate that for A in that case. 
And similarly, one's got, eventually got to terminate an output B. Okay, so now we've got our contradiction because they've terminated and given different outputs. Okay, so nice easy proof. Okay. Okay, so now basically what we want to do is, so if f is less than n over 3, sorry, f is greater than n over 3, it's not possible. We want to show it is possible if it's, if it's less than n over 3. Um, just to deal with, with BA, Byzantine Agreement, and SMR. At the same time, first of all, I want to show you that you can solve uh, Byzantine Agreement if you can solve SMR. Okay, where f is less than n over 3. Okay, suppose we've got a, a protocol for solving an SMR, and we can solve Byzantine Agreement uh, fairly simply. Okay, so we... We run an instance of SMR in which the number of clients is equal to the number of processes. Okay, and imagine clients have channels to all processes. Okay, and again, again, something similar to before. For each I, we have processor I also control client I. Okay, at time zero, each non-faulty processor I sends a single transaction from client I, which is a signed version of its input. Okay, and it sends that to all the processors. Okay, each non-faulty processor then just carries out the SMR protocol until it's confirmed n minus f signed values from distinct processors. And at this point, it outputs the majority value, right? Breaking ties in some arbitrary fashion. Okay, and that basically, the, the majority argument works because f is less than n over 3, right? So we, we'll still get the, the, the... We'll still have the majority amongst the, the n minus f values. Okay. Okay, so the main point there is it's quite easy to, to if, if you've got a protocol for SMR, it's quite easy to see you can solve by Zenta agreement. Uh, okay. Okay, so all we've got to do then to sort of wrap everything up is just to uh, solve SMR, right? Okay, so now we want to show the following thing. So in the partial synchronous setting, right, we've got a, we've got a PKI by Zenta volts. Okay, so now we can solve SMR when F is less than N over 3. Uh, and basically, what I'm going to do is sort of describe like a sort of slightly sort of tidied up version of Tendermint. Right? It's, basically, it's basically Tendermint, but made slightly easier to present, I think. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, how does Tendermint work? So, I guess what we're. So, the rough idea, first of all, okay, the sort of general picture. So, processes basically, they're going to take it in turn to act as leader. Okay. Protocols will be divided into round. Each round has, has one leader. Okay. In each round, the leader is going to propose like a, a new block of transactions, and then the other processes are going to vote on it. Okay, so it's a simple sequential process. So one, one process is leader, they propose a new block, everyone's going to vote on it. Then someone else proposes a new block, everyone's going to vote on that, and so on. That's the, that's the sort of basic format we're interested in. Okay. Okay, so if we're having uh, processes vote on blocks, then it's natural, we sort of naturally arrive at the idea of a quorum certificate, okay? So if N minus F processes produce signed votes for a particular block, right, in a particular round of voting, then we'll call that set of votes a quorum certificate for that block. Okay, so hopefully it's clear we're asking for N minus F here because we can't ask for more than that because the faulty processes might not give anything to us, okay? Okay, so in a particular round of voting, if everyone's voting on a, on a block, if we get N minus votes uh, for a block, we'll, we'll call that a quorum certificate. Okay. So easy observation then. So if non-faulty processes only vote on one block in each round of voting, right, they're only producing one vote, then two different blocks can't both get QCs in the same round. Okay, just a sort of simple county argument. Why is that? Well, if you've got two QCs, that, that corresponds to sort of two sets of N minus F, F votes. Okay? So that follows easily then, because so for two sets of N minus F processors, two sets of N minus F, you know, corresponding to two sets of N minus F votes, well, they've got at least N minus 2F in the intersection. And yeah, I guess you can see that in this little picture down here, that bit there, that's the size at least N minus 2F, yeah. Okay, so any, any two sets of n minus f, they've got at least uh, n minus 2 at the intersection. We're in the case f is less than n over 3, right? So 
n minus 2f is greater than or equal to f plus 1. Okay, so any two sets of n minus f have at least f plus 1 in the intersection. So in particular then, they've got at least one honest processor in the, in the intersection because we've only got f many faulty processors. Okay, but we said a non-faulty uh, processor won't vote twice. So that's a contradiction, right? They, they can't be voting for two different, two different things. Okay, so basic fact, okay? So if non-faulty processors only vote once, uh, in each round, we can't get two different blocks getting QCs in the same round. Okay. Okay, so now that's a basic idea. What I want to do is like put forward uh, a really simple idea that doesn't work, and then we'll tweak it a bit so it does work. Okay. Okay, so first of all, a little bit of housekeeping to, to keep things simple. Okay, I'm going to suppose that whenever a processor sees a block, they have automatically seen all the sort of predecessors of that block right, in, the, in, the, in the chain. Okay? So if you want to, you can achieve that, just like whenever you send out a block, you, already, you send with it the rest of the, the, the previous chain. Or if you think that's ridiculous and inefficient, you can imagine there's some sort of like uh, exchange of information protocol where if someone sends me a block and I don't know the predecessor, I say, can I have the predecessor, please? And I don't listen to the block until I've heard the predecessor. Right? Something like that. Okay. okay. Okay, so here's our sort of, well, a very simple plan. So we're going to order the, the QCs by round number. Okay, that's like I said, we're going to proceed like, like round one, round two, round three, round four, and so on. We're going to order the QCs by round number, so not necessarily according to like the, the, the height of the block they're corresponding to or anything like that, just by round number. Okay. In this simple version we're doing, first of all, so each round is of length two delta. Okay, so round R is going to start at time 2R delta. Yep. And round R is going to be very simple. So at time uh, 2R delta, when the round starts, it's round R. The lead is just going to produce a new block. Again, okay, they're going to do that in a sensible way. So they're basically going to look at the, the block with the highest QC that they've see, previously seen produced, and they're going to extend that. Okay. okay, so they produce a new block, and they can send that to all processes. Then at that, at that time t, at time t plus delta, right, when we hope that everyone else has sort of heard about that, if before GST they might not have done, but after GST they will, okay. At time t plus delta, then basically they're going to uh, vote on things, okay. So each processor checks whether they've received a block B from the, from the leader. If so, and if it looks sensible, okay, then they're going to send a signed vote for that block to all processors. Okay, so really simple, basically the, the leader proposes a block, Everyone waits time delta, and they, they vote on it. Okay, simple. Okay. okay, I mean, a block is confirmed in this simple version that doesn't work if it receives a QC. Okay. Okay, so that's uh, very nice, and it's simple, but it doesn't work. I guess it's quite easy to be simple if you don't work, but uh, Okay, so why doesn't it work? So a, a block B... Okay, so a block B might be confirmed at a particular round R before GST, the fact that it's confirmed doesn't mean that any of the blocks uh, know that it's confirmed. Though, right? They all produced the, the votes for the block, but they haven't necessarily seen that QC. Yes, yeah, so they've, they've produced all the, the, all the relevant votes, but they don't, they don't know it's confirmed. And then at the next round, right? so a block B prime, another block, which is incompatible with B, might be proposed and confirmed in the next round. Yeah? So the problem here is blocks could be com confirmed, although, you know, because you, basically because when it's confirmed, you don't necessarily see the QC involved. Okay. Okay, so that didn't work, but now what we can do is just a really simple little tweak and it'll work, okay? So what happens instead if we put in two stages of voting? Okay, so now it's gonna be the case that the leader proposes a block, we have a first stage of voting, and another stage of voting before the next leader proposes a block, okay? So in more detail, as follows. Okay, let's suppose, uh, <coughs> so the leader proposes the block, we have our stage one voting, same as before, but now, uh, if each processor sees a QC on the block produced in stage one of the round, right, in the first stage of voting, okay, then they produce a stage two vote. Okay? And it's a QC in stage two now that means confirmation. Not a, not a, the, the QC in stage one doesn't count for confirmation yet. It's the QC in stage two that counts. Okay, so it's still hopefully very simple. It's the same thing, we just added one more round in, okay? So now the, the time that the round takes is more than two delta? Yeah, no, it's three so delta, it's yeah. Three delta. Yeah, yeah. So you add an extra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Okay, so just to make that concrete, let's write it down. Okay, so again, we're all in the QCs by round number. Yep, yep. So, so each round is length three delta. So round R now starts at time three R delta. Okay, so at time T, at the beginning of the round, the leader just produces their new block. Time T plus delta, we do our stage one voting, right? Same as before. Time two plus delta, now each, each processor checks will receive a stage one QC for the block, okay? Uh, and now it sends a, a, a signed stage two vote to all processors. Okay. Okay, now our block is confirmed and it gets a stage two QC, okay? So I'm just repeating what I said before, but if I take it down again, in a slightly more formal way, so you have more time to think about it, I guess, okay? Okay. Okay, so where are we now? So does this work? Well, basically, it, it basically does, right? We just have to, to find a tiny tweak. Okay, so why? Well, so the, the problem with the previous protocol, right, was that the block might be confirmed, but non-faulty processors might not see the relevant QC. Okay, so how have we now improved in that situation? Well, now, if B is confirmed, okay, well, then that means in the stage, you get like N minus F, stage two votes. Okay, so that means at least N minus two F with F plus one, non-faulty processors must have seen the stage one QC, right? Because they, they wouldn't produce the stage two vote unless they see the stage one QC. That's when you produce a stage two vote, okay? So these N minus two F non-faulty processors must have seen the stage one QC for the block, right? Because we need at least N minus two F non-faulty processors to vote in the second round to produce confirmation, Because right? you need N minus F round two votes, so you need N minus two F honest votes. So it's N minus two F must have seen the stage one QC, otherwise they wouldn't produce that vote. Okay, so we're in a slightly better situation, right? They haven't necessarily seen the blocks confirmed, but they've at least seen, quite a few of them have seen the stage one QC is the point. Okay? Is that clear? So previously a block might be confirmed, no one's seen it. No one's seen the fact that it's confirmed. But now we've got something a little bit stronger, okay? If a block's confirmed, then at least a, a fair number of the, the non-faulty processes have seen the stage one QC for it. So now what we can do is a little trick. Suppose we now instruct processes have seen the stage one QC to lock on the block B. What does that mean? That means they don't yet consider it confirmed, but they'll now not vote for blocks incompatible with B while the block's in place. Okay, so if they see the stage one QC, they lock on that, it's not yet confirmed, but uh, they won't now vote for incompatible blocks while that lock is in place. If we do that, it's immediate, it's easy to see, we, we, we get the consistency. Right, so what do you want? We want consistency in liveness. We, we, from that, we're automatically going to get consistency. Why? So now the block B is confirmed in round R, right? Then as we're saying above, then at least N minus 2F non-faulty processes become locked on B, right? At least N minus 2F of, of them have to have seen the stage 1 QC. And that means they, they lock on B. Okay, but now, since at least N minus 2F non-faulty processes are required to produce any QC in subsequent rounds, in particular like a stage one QC, okay, this makes it impossible for any block incompatible with B to get a QC in subsequent rounds. Okay, so once they've locked on that, no subsequent block, no incompatible block, can get even a stage one QC and become confirmed. Okay, so this is a really simple little trick. We've, we've, we've definitely got consistency, okay, so we're happy. Okay, so we, see, we have two stages of voting. If we consider blocks confirmed when they see a stage QC, uh, but already have processes lock on a block when they see a stage one QC, then we'll satisfy consistency. Right, that's where we are so far. The slight danger now, and it's not too much of a problem, but uh, we can sort of easily solve it. The slight danger is that we might satisfy, we might uh, threaten liveness, okay? So now what could happen was, so for example, so a single non-faulty processor could become locked on some, some block, Maybe they see the stage one QC, but no one else does. Maybe it's just them that gets locked, right? In the next round, a single non-faulty processor J might get locked on some incompatible block. Okay, and if they get locked on those things, we're now, we sort of split the honest processes, and now we can't confirm new blocks. Because if the, if the faulty processes do nothing, then you need all the uh, non-faulty processes to be voting to get anything confirmed, right? You need A minus F signatures. So if they're now split, then it seems like we're in trouble. Okay, so now it's not possible to confirm new blocks if faulty processes do nothing. If those are gonna be, it's gonna be easy to fix. So after, basically after GST, these, these QCs will be seen, all right? So we just have a processor uh, uh, release their lock on some B if they see a higher QC for an incompatible block. So this one here, who's stuck on the, the first block there, if they see this second QC here, 
right? We're going to, if they sit at a particular point in execution in a way, they're going to just release their lock when they see the higher QC. Okay? And this will make things work out. Now, if you do that, the important thing is that this doesn't like, uh, spoil our previous consistency argument at all. Okay, if we're, if we're releasing a lock in that situation, it doesn't spoil the, the previous consistency argument, so let's go through it again. So if the block B is confirmed in round R, then at least n minus 2f non faulty processes become locked on B. And since at least n minus 2f non faulty processes are required to produce any QC, then you can't, no subsequent block can, can get a QC if it's incompatible with B. Okay, that's still true. Right? There's no situation here where re 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 here the context doesn't arise where we, we, we release a lock because we see a different QC. Right? Okay. Okay. So summary so far before we just write down the protocol. Uh, so if we have two stages of voting each round, if our processors lock in a block when they see a stage one QC, if they release the lock when they see an incompatible block with a higher QC. And they consider a block when it uh, confirmed when it gets a stage Q, two QC, then we'll satisfy consistency. And I'm saying it's going to be quite easy to show you that we satisfy liveness as well. So we'll see that after we define the protocol. Uh, okay. So first of all, the sort of boring preliminaries. Uh, okay. So processes begin with their lock set to be the genesis block. Okay. Uh, and it corresponds to round zero. All well, blocks and votes contain their round and stage number. I guess you can sort of ignore most of these points if you like. Um, <clears throat> Okay, we we consider like, the, the obvious order on QC. So I said that they're ordered by their round number. But okay, we also have two stages of voting now, right? So we order them by the round number and then the stage number within the round. Okay, this point is maybe more significant. Okay, so I'm going to assume each message has attached the block with the highest QC seen by the sending processor to go with that QC. So it's just going to make it sort of convenient in the liveness argument. So if, if I'm sending out a vote, then, like, uh, if I'm sending out a vote or I'm sending out a block, I send out together with that vote, I, just, I, I take the highest QC I've seen and I attach that, I append that to the message, okay, to, together with the, the corresponding block. Okay, okay and the, the highest quorum below a block is kind of what you think it would be, is the highest QC corresponding to any block amongst B and its ancestors, okay, its predecessors. Okay, okay. Here's the protocol then. So this is basically just the same protocol we wrote out before. I'm, all I'm adding in is the, the business with the locks. Okay, so it's basically just what you saw before, a tiny bit added. So each round is length three delta. So round R starts at time three R delta. Round R has processor R mod N as leader. Okay, at time the start of the round, the, the leader produces uh, a new block. Time T plus delta, we do our, our stage one voting. Okay, so each processor checks if it's received a block from the leader. If so, and if it extends their lock, or else if the highest QC below B is as high or higher than they've previously seen, and in that case, if, if, if that's true, then they, they release their lock, then they send a stage one vote. Okay, so basically, it has to extend their lock, or it has to be a situation where they're, 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 it's even a higher QC than their lock, and they should release their lock. Okay, okay then time uh, T plus two delta, we do stage two voting. Okay, so each process checks if it's seen a stage one QC for B. And if so, then it sets B as its lock and sets a state, sends a stage two vote to all processes. Okay, as, as before, a block is confirmed when it sees a, a stage two QC here. So the highest QCs that don't specify stage? Well, I just said highest is, they will be ordered by round and then stage within the, within the round. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we, we've already proved consistency, like the same proof works. Yeah. So why is that important? I thought you're only using Oh, it doesn't matter. No, you're right. I mean, yeah, it doesn't matter. It's either way. Okay. Um, okay, so we already proved consistency. Uh, so liveness isn't that hard either. Let's go through the liveness proof. Okay, so we consider a round, uh, just consider any round with a non faulty leader that begins at time t, which is at least like GST, uh, delta after GST. Okay. Okay, let B be the highest lock. So the, the worry is that they might propose a block and honest processes won't, won't vote for it because it doesn't extend their lock. Right? That's, that's, the, that's, that's the worry. But let B be the highest lock, I mean, the greatest, greatest round number, amongst all the non faulty processes at time T minus delta. That's the last time they could have set their lock. Okay, well, basically, they'll, they'll send a vote at that time, which the leader will receive. So he'll have seen all of those, uh, all those QCs, right? He'll have seen this corresponding QC. 
Okay, so the non-faulty leader will see the corresponding QC by, by time t, and they'll, they'll, they'll propose a block that all the, the honest processes are going to be happy to vote for, basically, yeah? Okay, all non-faulty processes will then, because they're happy for it, they'll produce votes for the block in stages one and two, and then we've got a confirmed block. Okay, so that's a, a simple liveness argument. Okay, so that is like, well, a, a version of sort of tender bit like protocol. Uh, so just before we leave it behind, I'm gonna, uh, we, can, we can make it even simpler. Okay, so there, we started off with this idea of like a one round thing where we had like the, the leader proposed a block and everyone voted, right? And we said that didn't, doesn't work, so we had to put in two rounds. In fact, you can make the really simple one work as well. If we now take our, the ideas we've developed, okay, basically by, by chaining things, okay? So what we can do, yeah, we get a, a simple protocol with a single round of voting uh, if we apply our new notion of confirmation together with locking. So I won't describe this formally or completely, but here's the basic idea. So rather than having two stages of voting in each round, we have a single stage, but we have votes for that stage count in two ways. Okay. So first of all, they stay at the count as a stage one vote for that round, right? The block at that round. And if that block extends at like a round R minus one block with a QC, we also consider them as a, like a stage two vote for the previous round. Right, so now playing two different roles. Okay, so now we see QC is corresponding to two compatible blocks and two successive rounds, R and R plus one. Then we consider the block at round R confirmed. Okay, so we basically sort of managed to make that initial really simple uh, protocol work. So this is some power of x uh, well, see, so when you see one block confirmed, okay, yeah, you, see, you see, two, see two successive blocks with QCs, then you consider this one confirmed. I, I, don't, I don't know if it's affecting finality, but yeah, it's not, it's not really impacting latency either, because you had to have two rounds before, right? So it's like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, just to summarize where we are, so that's the result so far, okay? So we've got Byzantine Agreement, Byzantine Broadcast, SMR. Synchronous with PKI, synchronous no PKI, synchronous, I've written psych, uh, PKI, okay. Uh, yeah, so if we're synchronous setting with PKI, uh, we know Byzantine agreement can't be solved if f is greater than n over 2, greater than or equal to n over 2, but it can if it's less. Byzantine broadcast NAF and SMR if f is less than n over 2, but again, the setup there, the precise definition of SMR matters a little bit for that, that, that to happen. Uh, if you have no PKI, so we can do it even only if f is uh, less than n over 3. And the partially synchronous setting, okay, so we can't do Byzantine broadcast, but we can do the other two if f is less than n over 3. Okay, so to finish off then, let's just compare uh, those results with like, what happens for permissionless protocols, and specifically what happens with Bitcoin. Okay, so in what sense does Bitcoin satisfy SMR? Well, first of all, okay, so, so far we've, we've been talking about deterministic protocols. One difference is so uh, Bitcoin is probabilistic, um, as I guess you're probably aware. So Bitcoin only works in the synchronous setting. Okay, it doesn't, doesn't work in the partially synchronous setting. We still have to ask the question, so does Bitcoin actually satisfy SMR? And maybe that depends on how you define SMR, right? So we also had this like lazy client condition, right? So just to remind you what that was. Well, so in particular, the way we defined SMR was a client should receive F plus one confirmation for a given transaction, even only if it's confirmed. Okay, so we obviously have, we, have, we, have, we don't yet have a definition that makes sense actually in the permission setting, right? Because that, that doesn't work in the permission setting. But the idea behind that definition was that we wanted the, the clients to be like passive and also lazy. So the idea was they, they could sort of go away, pay no attention, come back, and they know accurately when, when, uh, whether when, when transactions are confirmed, right? Okay, so uh, does Bitcoin satisfy that condition? So if, if you're you know, you, you put your transactions in, you go away, and you come back. It could be that the set of miners has changed entirely. You don't know who they are. You don't know what the longest chain is. Okay, if you can connect to someone who's an honest miner, then you can learn what the longest chain is, etc. But how do you know who's honest, right? So you can try and connect into lots of different people, but, uh, you know, potentially there could be a civil attack in which they, they just have loads and loads of different miners with low computational power. How do you know whether people are honest or not? Right, so you can ask, so does Bitcoin really give a, a, a like permissionless solution to SMR that defends against civil attacks? 
And it depends on your definition of SMR. If you, if you require that lazy client condition, then it doesn't. But OK, maybe it's not that serious. Because it does allow clients to go away and come, uh, and come back and learn like, correctly what's happened. So long as when they, they come back, they connect to at least one uh, honest processor, right? But still, uh, strictly speaking, if we're being a little difficult about it, that's not a, uh, no, it doesn't provide a permissionless uh, defense against civil attacks, right? OK. I'm a little confused. I mean, in the, in the previous setting, we still need to connect to somebody who's QDF plus one company. Yeah, OK, but in, in the previous setting, I could, do, I could ensure I do, but we weren't worried about civil attacks, also, with the point. But I could, I could ensure I do just by connecting to F plus one. I know I'm connected to someone who's honest, so there's a simple way of doing it. And also, I'm not worrying about civil attacks. So here, I am worrying about civil attacks, so I'm sort of regarding that as being a problem, you see what I'm saying? I mean, you can say that that's fine, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm happy to go along with it. It's fine. Fundamentally, that's the same thing. I mean, it's just both of the same thing. You can make the one honest person. You're just saying, like, if you. Right, no, the, 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 there's a claim made, isn't there, though, about Bitcoin. The idea is this provides a permissionless solution to SMR that defends against civil attacks, right? So in, in the previous setting, okay, fine, we had to connect to an honest guy, but we weren't worried about civil attacks. That wasn't really an issue. Here, I'm saying that's supposed to be an issue, right? Uh, I so the way I would phrase it is, in both the contexts, in some sense, the assumption is exactly the same, that they can figure out one on a snow to connect to. And then you can say, by the way, if you're in the permission setting with known F, a strategy that came into you doing that is that it's F plus one people. Whereas in the permission setting, so that unspecified how you might go about finding right. one on yes. so, okay. a snow, from a practical right. perspective, that presumably it's not very difficult. I think that's a, a more positive way of putting it. Fine. Okay. <laughs> okay, 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 good. Okay, yeah. Okay, so anyway, maybe, maybe we're happy with that anyway, right? It seems to, seems to work, uh, it's fine. Okay, so now let's suppose we're happy. I assume clients can connect to at least one honest node. Maybe that's not too much of an issue anyway, right? So then, how do we compare that with uh, results in the permission setting? So I guess a natural thing you might do is you might compare it to this. So, so Bitcoin's working without a public, public infrastructure. Okay, so you might, it's working in the synchronous setting, not the, public, the partially synchronous setting. So you might want to compare it with this result here, right? You might say, well, Bitcoin uh, uh, works whenever f is less than n over 2, which is definitely better than f being less than n over 3. That's good, but in fact, it's, it's, it's more better than that. <laughs> uh, why? Well, because proof of Bitcoin don't normally assume uh, authenticated channels. So I don't really need authenticated channels for that in some sense. So processors just like broadcast messages to all in some sense because like, go, they assume that they spread across the network. So in the permission setting, without PKI and with broadcast in the sense that if I send a message at time t, everybody has to receive it within time t plus delta, then it isn't possible to handle even a, a single uh, faulty processor. Okay, so in that sense, Bitcoin's raising f equals zero to f less than a half. So it's making a big, big improvement. Right? Okay, so I'll finish a little early, but thanks for listening. Okay. Yeah, there are a couple of papers in there. There's one with, I forget all the authors from uh, 2005 or so, I think. I can also show you a sort of simple proof later on as well. Okay. Okay. Well, there like two sentences of the question Well, basically, imagine the setting. Okay, imagine we're doing broadcast. There's no sort of private channels between each of us. If, I, if I'm the adversary, I'm the bad guy, whenever you speak, I can just be annoying and say the opposite of you. And so I can simulate all of you, right? If there's no restriction on how, how, how I can simulate people. So whenever you speak, I just say the opposite. <laughs> and then how could anybody else listening in distinguish between like, you know, what, what's happening, right? <laughs> Do you want to comment if you go one slide back? Like it almost looks like there's a mathematical contradiction, like everything you said, right? <laughs> I know. Probably with the comment. Say again, how's it a contradiction? Well, that's an if and only if, right, in that red box, right? Uh, so you're saying, how does Bitcoin overcome that, you're saying? Right. Yeah, okay. So I guess it overcomes it by... So, right, so if you look at the, the, the proof we did that, that proved that result, okay, there was... Um, so we had the sort of six-node version, we had the four-node version. It's crucial to that, that, that proof that the adversary is able to simulate a certain number of processes, right? So in the six-node version, actually, that's less relevant here, right? The four-node version is the one that matters. It was necessary there that the, the adversary could simulate, like, uh, half the processes in that proof, 
Right? So if you, if you change their ability to do that, if they can't, if you restrict their ability to produce hashes and stuff, then that proof falls apart. And that's another reason why I think the four node version is interesting. I think it shows you exactly the, the point at which it falls apart as well. So why, I mean, why is it relevant in the six node version? So in the six node version, it was what the, in order to be, the, get it, so the version would have to be able to simulate like two thirds of the processes yeah. to cause a problem. In the four node version, they only need to be able to simulate half the processes to cause a problem, right? So as long as, as, long as you, uh, so if you restrict them to being able to simulate less than half the processes, if you take like F less than over two, then, then it's fine, right? Right, there's a proof for saying you can't simulate anything more than what you are. Right, right. okay, but your, your, your general requirement is that the, the adversary has like less than half the sort of computational power, right? So they, they can't sort of simulate more than the, the rest of the guys there, right? So if you inspect those two proofs, I think the, okay. I think the, the n equals four, the, the four node proof is more sort of uh, informative in that, in, more, in that regard. Yeah. All right. <laughs>